So I'm having the, these dialogues with my body. And, sure. And before I go into it, I tell my body, and this part of the self-coaching is, I, I tell my body, I'm going to take care of you. And I always do. Welcome to the Red Beard Embodiment Podcast. I am your host, Alex Green. And I'm on a mission to bring the power of embodiment to people all around the world. In this podcast, we explore how embodiment practices, trauma healing, and knowledge about the human nervous system can help us find our ground, discover new sources of meaning, and create connection in an ever-changing world. The deepest change is embodied change. Awesome. Well, I'm really excited to be sitting down today with Renee Tillotson. And Renee is in Honolulu, and I'm in Boulder, Colorado, where I usually record from. And just briefly about Renee, Renee is the uh, owner and visionary behind a, a very cool um, uh, multi, multi-disciplinary multi movement and meditation center in downtown Honolulu called the Still and Moving Center. And I was lucky to uh, per, uh, join last December. I was in Honolulu and um, and, and uh, participated, gave some TRE workshops uh, there live at the studio. It's a beautiful space. And I offered some online courses over the course of this past year uh, in TRE as well. And in that time, I came to know uh, what an amazing, what a unique um, uh, organization Still and Moving Center is, and also what a unique uh, story and journey uh, Renee here has had uh, in the movement world, in the in the meditation world, and in the sp- in the spirituality space. And so, uh, the purpose of today's conversation is um, just to hear about Renee's uh, very interesting journey and the founding of a Still and Moving Center and its mission and work in the world, and then also some other projects uh, that Renee is working on. She's developing. Um, a mindfulness movement coaching program. I might not have gotten that exactly right, but we'll talk about that. And she has a forthcoming book that she's been working on, um, on related themes. And so this is what I was hoping to uh, sit down and explore today. But Renee, thanks so much for, for being on the, on the show today. Oh, I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Very good. Awesome. Well, maybe we'll just start with like, um, you know, I, I usually like to kind of start with backstory and things like that. And I was reading, you know, you know, we, 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 we've had some conversations and I heard some of your journeys and reading some of the newsletter. I've heard some of the recent things and looking on the website, I got to see a, a bit of a snippet of kind of your own journey about early, early athletics was the way I understood it. And then sometime sort of mid mid life, kind of a return to movement via NIA. Um, which sounded like a, a pretty interesting catalyst for sort of a next chapter of, of your of your life. But maybe you could just tell us a little bit about kind of what's what's important to know about your own background that led you to be curious about the body, be curious about movement, dance, and yeah, just very, tell us tell us that story a little bit. Well, I'd love to. Well, I do want to say right at the beginning a little bit about the present and the future, just so it's at the beginning of our podcast. Um, I am most recently the legacy founder of the Academy of Mindful Movement. And that is originally set up in order to take uh, instructors, coaches of almost any movement discipline and train them to teach their own discipline with techniques of mindfulness, using that observer stance to allow themselves to self-coach, and even more importantly, to train their movers to be able to self-coach because they're not always there with their instructors and their coaches. 99% of their lives, they're on their own. So how can we get our movers to self-coach? And really, that's... I'm I'm bullet... I'm highlighting this phrase, self-coach, in my mind because I want to unpack I, I want to unpack exactly what that means. It's the first time I've heard that word. So I, so later in the conversation, I want to I want to. Yeah, talk well, about we'll it. definitely get back to that. And okay. so the um, the name of my upcoming book will be Mindful Movement: The Art of Self Coaching. 
Okay, there well, we go. I just want to put there that no, there. No, no, that's so very good. Forward. I appreciate that. <laughs> cool. All right. Okay. Well, then rewind. Take us rewind in history. Tell us how you became the uh, the visionary, mindful mover, self coacher that you are today. <laughs> Well, I was a gymnast as a kid, right. and um, I did that from ages 11 through 22. And um, I, uh, in addition to um, performing competitively and being the team captain at high school and college levels, I, I wasn't like one of those elite headed for the Olympic um, gymnasts, but, you know, it was something I, I found uh, a great deal of satisfaction and, sure. and uh, I tend to have a high energy level, and I think that was a really good way to channel that physical energy. Uh, and it, it taught me a great deal of um, body awareness and self-discipline. And um, then I went on to my work life and getting married and having kids. And, you know, I was one of those soccer, baseball, track, uh, soccer uh, moms, you know, um, yeah, all yeah. our kids through all those different sports. And meanwhile, like mom just didn't do very much physically. And uh, we began to have um, some real problems with our older son. Uh, and I just had uh, the brilliance of our younger son coming up to me and going, no, nah, you should take an exercise class. <laughs> and this was, you know, the wisdom from the mouth of babes. <laughs> oh my gosh, you are so right. <laughs> so I think I went that very day, I signed up at the YMCA and um, here I am, I'm in my mid forties. Um, the only class I could figure out to take was a senior aerobics class because I was so out of shape. But I had to, gotta, gotta start somewhere, yeah. Gotta start somewhere. So I, I take these um, uh, hot showers or, or hot tubs before I could go to class or I'd be spraining my muscles right and left in the seniors. <laughs> right, right. But pretty soon I got back into you know, my body again, it moved me. It felt so great. Oh, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. And the seniors next to me are starting to go, who does she think she is? <laughs> right, right. You're getting getting a little high up there. Yeah. You know, I wasn't like, I wasn't doing it like the teacher and like everybody else anymore. Right. So then uh, a woman stepped in to sub the class one day. She said, Hi, I'm Carmen. Take off your shoes. We're going to do Nia. Okay. We kind of all looked at each other like, what's that? Yeah. And she started moving, and it started to feel really good in my body, and it was non-impact, and yet I was getting a really great uh, workout. And there were different elements to it. There, there was the dance part, but then there was more like the martial arts and... um. And there were things on the floor that were more, you know, yoga, Feldenkrais-like. And pretty soon I just started following her all over the city, taking many classes a week. I was just, I, I just like became an addict. Yep. <laughs> Me and that. <laughs> and it went on for a, a little over a year. Right. At the end of one of her classes, she announced, that was my last class. I am retiring from Nia. Wow. Okay. And I just had that really visceral feeling of when they say feeling the rug get pulled out from under you. That's what it was. Yeah. Like, how can you do this to me? Like, this is my joy. This is. Yeah. You know, this is what gets me present in all the worries of the family and the business and all that stuff. Very left behind. Right. So I, I did my best to try to find a, a, you know, somebody to take her place. 
and I wasn't finding anybody. What, and I, what's, were, you, were you in California at the time? or in Santa, Santa, Santa already? California. Santa Barbara. Okay. Yeah. Santa, yeah. Uh, where we raised our kids. And uh, yeah. so all of them are in high school by the, that time. And uh, so anyway, uh, I didn't find anybody. And I just thought, well, in case I don't find somebody, I think I better just get trained in this because it's way too good to be lost. You know, the why it needs this program. I need this program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yep. So I went to Portland, Oregon, um, and I got my the yeah, white belt training of okay. the founders of me. And I, I went straight to the source, which um, yep. I always did for every belt level after that. Um, right. I always wanted to get it pure as I could, right from the, the from founders the, from the of the program. Totally. Debbie Roses and Carlos Roses. Pause for a second, if you will, just for anybody who hasn't, who doesn't know what Nia is. Could you yeah. just give kind of just the over? It's dance, it's movement, it's march. But to give give a just a little window of something little, you're familiar with. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's a fusion movement practice. It does fuse three of the dance arts, three of the martial arts, and three of the healing arts. Those healing arts include yoga, Helen Christ, and Alexander technique. I see. And it's done barefoot to music. Um, the first principle of Nia is the joy of movement. And I think that was absolutely life transformational to me. I I have carried that with me, I think, ever since. It's, uh, yeah. it's difficult. Uh, I, I just can't imagine my life without being able to access this kind of joy. Joy of movement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and it's, uh, it's done to what we call soul stirring music. There's, um, there is choreography involved and there's a huge invitation to move your own body's way, find your body's way of moving this move. Yeah. So that is a really big key to, uh, moving mindfully that we have to tune into our own body sensation. We have to pay attention to what it's saying. Right. We have to adapt whatever movement is being modeled or uh, cued by the instructor. We have to make it like fit our bodies, right? How does, okay. how does my body fit into this movement? Make it mine. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and then from there, we can start moving it. We can start energizing that move. But we have to make sure it fits us first. And that's really important from a safety perspective. So that's that's what uh, Nia was. Yeah, great great explanation. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, um, I kept going, okay, that's good. I got that. Yeah. And I just kept getting pulled on and on and on. And so... I uh, I am now a um, as high as you can go in in terms of the trainings. I'm a, a right. second degree black belt NIA instructor. Okay. And where I stopped is the next kind of chapter in the story. Um, you could go one step farther and become a NIA teacher trainer. Okay. Training other people to become NIA teachers, right? Sure. Sure. And I, um, I was spending so much time in the headquarters taking all these trainings. <laughs> I think, you know, a, a little attention got attracted. Uh, uh, so Debbie Rosas invited me to become one of the international teacher trainers. And at that point in time, there were only 14 um, in the world. I see. Yeah, so yeah. Was, okay. Well, quite an honor to be invited. Yeah, to be invited. Yeah. yeah. I had never aspired to that. That's not what I wanted to do. Um, and yet a friend of mine says, oh, Renee, at least you have to consider it. This really is a big honor, so you have to think about it. So I spent the next several months preparing for an event that Debbie Roses was going to have called Courting Your Destiny, where... Other people who had been invited to become NIA teacher trainers were going to go, and we were asked to hoard our destiny, like asking 
somebody's hand in marriage, right? Not sure. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> am I going to marry myself to this path of becoming a NIA teacher trainer? Right. And in those few months of imagining transforming my life, because at that point in time, I was highly involved in our family's construction company. Okay. Um, and I was going to have to go through 20 hours a week of uh, training to become a teacher training. And I was going to need to travel the world at least four times a year. I'd need to travel the world to, to go and give a NIA teacher training. I see. And I thought, oh my gosh, you know, this is such a life yeah, transformation. That massive, massive commitment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if I can imagine changing my life like that, what else can I imagine? Like, it was sort of a question like, Renee, what do you want to be when you grow up? I potentially have the energy to do that. What else What else do, do I have the energy or vision for? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and all the rest of my life, like, I had never had a, an ambition. I got out of college and, uh, what? All the rest of my family are teachers. I'll become a teacher. Okay. And then uh, we had our three kids, and there were too many little kids in the house for me to <laughs> put them all into preschool and pay for it. <laughs> right, right. My husband says, well, why don't you just join me in the construction company? Because, you know, you probably make us more money that way than as a teacher when you go back to school. So, right, oh, right. Okay, I'm going to do that. And then I went to the construction industry. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And all those were fine. But all of a sudden, I had had this, oh, I forgot to tell you, after my first NIA teacher retired, within a couple of weeks, I had this, I don't know what it is, like a vision of voice or something that, that told me, Renee, you were born to dance. And maybe everybody else in the world is too. I didn't know about that, but I knew all of a sudden I was born to dance. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. So I, I go to this. Um, this is coming to you in, the, in your mid forties or something, right? This. Yes. This yes. idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep. So now we're a number of years later. Um, in 54, I think. Yeah. And um, and I go to this event, According Your Destiny, to see if it's my destiny to become a NIA teacher trainer. Right, right. And we're in this room with uh, uh, crimson cushions. We're all sitting around in a circle. There's a vase of long stem roses in the center and a box where we're supposed to put our answer about whether or not we're going to be coming. Uh, Nia teacher trainers or whether we're going to remain Nia teachers. And so I'm, I'm just like having this quiet moment. And it was like, no, that's not my destiny. I have now made it to Honolulu. I've gotten my kids out of high school and in this beautiful place. Um, well, why would I want to leave and go traveling all over the world um, when I, I'm here? What about just creating a studio that's a hub right. that, that people can come to? Why, why don't I do that? Right. And then within like 30 seconds, I realized, yeah, but it can't just be Nia. That's, that, there's not enough people in Honolulu to want that. <laughs> be doing the yeah. whole time. <laughs> right, right. So what is it that you love about me, Renee, that could serve as the overarching umbrella? Right. Uh, that that could go over everything that happens in this um, studio you're talking about. Right. I love that Nia is a moving meditation. For me, it's a moving meditation. Yeah. And I dive into it, I am so fully engaged that nothing else is going on. I just 
fully present in that moment. I'm carrying my intention for a class all the way through. I'm, you know, aware of body sensations. And by the time I get out of that class, I am just so filled with joy. I just, I just love everybody in the whole world. If you were right there, I'd be hugging you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there's this kind of glow that follows me around. Why do I laugh to work? Right, right. And, you know, this, this moving meditation, I have never really felt particularly um, successful at sitting meditation. And so to discover, yeah, but I can access moving meditation. Right. It was just phenomenal. And I thought, no, I, I bet there are not a lot of other practices through right. which people can enter. And enter into meditation. Moving, moving meditation. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's do that. Let's open a studio and pull all these other teachers from these different practices that could be uh, done as whipping meditations. Um, and so that's what I did. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. I will yeah. remain a Nia teacher. Uh, thank you so much for opening up this other idea of possibilities for me. Yep. Uh, when come to Honolulu, <laughs> I told my husband, Let me see. I'm going to be opening up a movement studio. <laughs> you're, you're what? Yeah, opening a movement studio. Right. <laughs> he goes, well, well, why are you doing that? I just have to. No, I just have to. Yeah, right. <laughs> and it didn't take very long, really, for me to uh, convince him this, that this was something that was like a life destiny thing right. for me. Right. Right. So it helped me create Still a Moving Center. It's a 6,000 square foot studio, two floors, a number of yeah. um, different movement studios, massage rooms, um, right. and so on in there. Honolulu. And that was in uh, 2011. Okay. And uh, here we are in 2024. Thir 13 years later, and it's going strong. Well, yeah, that was just briefly. I mean, that well, when, when I was first introduced to you, um, by Gene, uh, ahead of my trip out there. And I, and I looked at the website and, 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 and I was, and, and that was what struck me. And as a person who, you know, um, my company Redbeard, it's, 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 there's a little, there's one similarity is there's this interest in bringing different modalities together. Most of those aren't class type formats. That's more kind of therapeutic work. But I, I went to the still and moving center website and I was just like, wow, here's some, here's hula. Here's some um, aerial uh, aerial classes. Here's here's um, body work. Here's martial arts tai chi. Um, just the breadth of of uh, activities, uh, kind of under one roof, so to speak. And I was like, oh, this is this is speaking my language. You know, having having these things kind of kind of brought together. Um, so such a cool, such a just an amazing concept. Tell us tell us a little bit about the name. Um, because I'm guessing that has meaning for you. Yeah, it's a, a swish, paintbrush kind of swish, right? Not in the center. And the name Still in Living Center is very much connected with that that logo. Um, the the swish is the movement, and yep. the dot is the still center. So the concept is that. In the midst of our body's motion, we are able to find a still center. And by practicing that in a movement practice, and, and it, we don't just talk about like the slow <laughs> yoga tai chi practices. Like Nia, we can really get moving. Still find that, that still center. Right. So uh, it's really in the midst of, of active motion in some cases. Yeah. That idea is that our practice of doing that in the studio is something that we can take out into the world. So we walk out that door, all of a sudden we're in busy Honolulu, everything's in a swirl around us. 
and we know how to hold our still center. Stillness, yeah. Yeah, so that's the, the meaning behind still yeah. and moving center. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I love that. How has it grown over those years? I mean, so you launched and, you know, t and to me now there's this massive programming and then, you know, you, you've, you offer a lot online. I, I wonder if some of that had to do with, I wonder if the pandemic changed. I mean, you have teachers from all around the world um, offering on part of the virtual programs. And of course, you have full programming uh, live. Well, what's been the evolution of that? We... um. We closed our doors on March 17th of 2020 uh, due to the pandemic and not wanting to be, you know, part of spreading it. And uh, we reopened on uh, March 22nd, five days later, as an online studio. And Got within it. a couple of weeks, we had all of our classes uh, are learning. Yep. Uh, and we uh, gained a great international following. A number of people had already um, visited us when they came to Honolulu as travelers, visitors. Yeah. And um, so they found us online and then a number of other people joined us. And then all of a sudden now we had access to teachers that we hadn't had access before, such as yourself, uh, over in Colorado, being able to teach at our studio. Right, right. So... Um, it was a real anchor for many, many, many of our students, as well as our teachers. We always give time before and after class for, you know, conversation, for um, community building. And I think that's one of Still Living Center's great hard strength is that we build community. It's not just about holding the body. Yeah. You know, there's a, a real warmth that probably you were able to experience Without question, yeah, definitely, yeah. Yeah, so we just have um, the best teachers, and people really, I think, recognize that, and wonderful staff, really caring staff. Uh, and so then coming out of the pandemic, a uh, little bit of tapering of uh, the online participation as people want to be out in the world in their own uh, hometowns and so on um and yet it's it's great sometimes uh the people who i have online taking classes are right in honolulu but it wasn't convenient for them to uh leave home that that day so uh um, right. rejoined me online and, and for our other classes as well um and uh so my other thing that happened during the pandemic was I really wanted to be able to uh, have a page on our website where I could let people know about other mindful movement classes. Okay. And maybe this is a good little moment to say that I think a moving meditation is uh, maybe an overly high uh expectation for me to uh, expect of all our, our teachers to lead all of their students into uh, living meditations. Sure. Okay. Or, okay. And, yeah. and yet everybody can lead a uh, mindful movement class. Right. right. And um, so I, uh, when I wanted to create this website that would talk about all these other places where people could take uh, mindful movement classes, I realized, well, you know, our reputation is really important to me. I really vet every teacher who comes under our roof, and right. I I train them in, uh, or, or give them kind of pointers about how to make their classes more mindful and so on. Right. And how do I know whether these people in these other movement uh, studios and gyms and so on are teaching? Equally vetted, yes, I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I I think if if I know that they're Feldenkrais trained. Right. Okay. I I know that they and are certain next yeah, you have a certain understanding of what they've brought in. Yes, because I know how intimately 
Feldenkrais teachers are trained over their four years of training to really tune into body sensation. Right. Uh, and I know how the craft, how the practice was crafted by Moshe Feldenkrais, who understood the human nervous system so explicitly, so well. And, um, you know, he was one of the forefathers of neuroplasticity. Yep. So if they're Feldenkrais trained, okay, they're doing mindful movement. But pretty much right. other than that, I mean, we've, we've got yoga teachers in the world who, you know, go to yoga competitions to see who can be the bendiest pretzel. It's okay. <laughs> and then yeah. so many people have endured of, yeah. you know, injuries in, in yoga classes that are not being taught mindfully. And so I'm just going, like, how do I know what body is certifying whether, you know, certain teachers are, are, are mindfully. Have a, have a mindfulness, a, a real Mindfulness uh, yes. orientation. Yeah. Yes. In yeah. their movement practice. Are they being mindful in their movement practice? We're not talking about this kind of mindfulness going to your, um, you know, different retreats. And not, yeah. Stuff. Not simply st still meditation. You're talking applied in a movement domain. Yes. Yep. Right. Yep. And I, um, I, well, actually, I was waiting outside a studio to sub for a, a NIA class for somebody. And there was a, a CrossFit gym that I was looking into, and I was watching all these, uh, you know, 20, 30 year old somethings with these big kettlebells. And they're just swinging them down between their legs, over their heads, just with reckless abandon. And I'm just, it's a, you know, I already need the disc waiting to happen. Right, right. Is this terrifying to me? And I'm who is training these people or not training? <laughs> right. And, and they could be trained. Uh huh. You know, the coaches of of these people could be trained to be leading these people in so much more mindful, safe movement. Okay. Okay. And it it just kind of went. I guess we're going to have to, you know, open a place that certifies people as when yeah. movement coaches and instructors. Got it. So, <laughs> that was the genesis of This is the academy. birth of the Academy of Mindful Movement. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. For you regular listeners to the podcast, you know that about half of these episodes focus on TRE, tension and trauma releasing exercises. And I wanted to make sure that you know about the Redbeard TRE certification program, our educational platform to certify others. And we have both an online version of that that I teach, as well as an in-person version of the training that my colleague Ellen McKenzie teaches in Madison, Wisconsin. My next online certification training is beginning August 3rd and 4th, 2024. That's the first of three modules. And the way the certification program works is it's about a 10 to 12 month program divided into three phases of learning, each with a weekend connected to it, and then some one-on-one -on -one work with me and, and people on my team to support your learning journey. TRE has been a life-changing modality for myself. It's open to people with any background. I wanted to make sure you know about the program. You can find more information at redbeardtre.com launched so it's it's ha it's 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 happening yeah i got together with um douglas grosser who's uh been in um, academics his entire career we uh created a curriculum for level one mindful movement instructor training the 40-hour training it takes uh folks who are coaches or instructors of movement from virtually any field um there's a little bit of uh, a question. Um, I don't know what I'm going to do if I get someone whose movement practice is really dedicated to violence because that one of the principles behind uh, the academy, one of the pillars of the academy is nonviolence. 
Sure. Okay. Uh, yeah. If it's deliberately striving to damage the human body, oh. I, I it just can't, doesn't fall under the purview of mindfulness. But yeah. anyway, the okay. short of that, uh, uh, it takes experienced instructors, coaches, and has them use these very specific mindfulness techniques in motion yeah. and apply it to their movement practice. It's very interactive. It's a 40-week course that is a one hour a week of independent study, two hours with the whole group. Uh, it's an yeah. online course that was started during the pandemic. And we have had graduates from all over the world and all I, different kinds of movement practices. Yeah. And that one hour a week is with half the group and a pod where you're even doing more. And so earned. each week you're having a chance to apply a, a few different mindful movement techniques to your practice. And then you teach your practice to your fellow trainees. So we've had people to teaching um, hula and belly dance, but also tennis. You know, we all have our imaginary tennis racket. We've had people teaching us aerial and we're either on the floor or in a chair. Um, <laughs> we, we've learned hockey and delightful hockey from other trainees. Okay. Um, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so everybody gets the practice over and over of uh, applying these different techniques um, to their practice. Right. Well, do you want to hear a little bit about? I want to hear a lot. Of, I want to hear a lot about it. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. Keep going. Okay. Yeah. So we, we teach to the whole human being. Okay. And so many times um, in a movement practice, we think that we're just training a person's body. Okay. And, um, and we're all so much deeper and richer than that. Uh, we have to approach our movers from this multi-dimensional perspective. Right. Um, so in terms of the body, though, we're really paying attention to body sensation. We're right. using that body sensation to uh, guide our movement in safe uh, and effective ways. Um, and also, when I say effective, it doesn't mean that we're just always toning it down. And sometimes... You know, like when I was uh, in that seniors aerobics class, right? Um, as I listened to my body and I, I started getting back in shape, right? I began really pumping it up. I'm Ramp, ramping it up, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. That's what my body was telling me to do. And I was like, more. yeah, I'm sorry, guys, but this is what I'm being asked to do. <laughs> I'm being led. I'm being called to do yes. this way. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so uh, all these different ways of cueing people to be listening to body sensation and doing something about the information that they're getting. Yep. Because yep. these these bodies of ours are like living instruction manuals. Okay. They always, always telling us what they want and what they don't want, what feels good, what doesn't feel good. And so much of our our training, I think, in our lives is usually on blocking that out, blocking that out. Yep, yep. And and here we're saying, invite it in. Yeah. Invite it in. And don't override it by saying, no pain, no gain. Right. Pain is just weakness leaving, leaving the body. Yeah. Pain is an informant. <laughs> right. And there are different kinds of pain. There's there's discomfort that's right. telling you maybe slow down or go easy. Uh, you know, being able to distinguish between a discomfort and a pain is an important thing. I mean, you need yeah. to do a little bit of breaking down of the muscles to to strengthen them, right? Sure. For example, but right, right. Okay, so for the body, we're we're really um, teaching attention to body sensation. Yep. Uh, a big thing for the mind, and this is some something I really gained from the Nia practice, is that we as 
instructors can set an intention for ourselves and for our, our students. Yep. And that acts as, I want to say something like a zip line that carries us from one portion of our movement practice to the next. Okay. So, um, and I had a really kind of fun anti example of it. <laughs> I once went to a Nian teacher's class and she said, All right, students, our intention today is to move from our body center, our Dantian, our Hara. And so right. we're down here, he left, moving from my body center all through class and and like, oh, I've never done this, you know, footstep. From your, from your center before. Yeah, yeah. Moving yeah. from this low body center. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. And I'm having all these cool kind of discoveries. As I'm doing. I didn't hear a word for her about moving from, from center. Right. I, her seeding that intention. Yeah. Like, it was just very, I don't know, like revelatory to me. The way I was moving every piece of choreography she was taking us through. Right, right. And then we get to the end of class and she realizes, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to close with my intention. And I see her eyes kind of go. Right. And she goes, so, so today, students, we, we're working with expressive arm and hand movements. <laughs> right. She'd forgotten. She'd forgotten the uh, the theme for the day. Yeah, she, she forgot her intention. Right. However, the fact that she had said it even at the, just at the beginning right. gave me as her student. Yep. Something to focus my mind, like yeah. she was doing a routine I'd done many times before. Right. I, I could have just gotten bored. Oh, you know, I know this move. I know that. But the fact that now. Yeah. I'm moving from my low body center to do all these moves. Yeah. I really engage my mind, my imagination, the body and body connection yeah. was being forged all the way through. So this is one of the the ways that um, we work with the mind is teaching people this difficult use of an intention. From the beginning to the middle to the very end of whatever your movement session is, that becomes a meditation in itself. We call it continuity of consciousness. Mm -hmm. That's attention to to sensation is one of the the um, pillars. Continuity of consciousness for yeah. the mind is one of the pillars. Yeah, uh, I've already mentioned uh, nonviolence to you. Right. Over and that's at every aspect of the human being. It, right. Nonviolence to body, to the emotional nature, the heart, nonviolence to the mind. And then um, also joy. That's that's the the fourth of the pillars. It, nice. It, is joy. And and that comes with um, a spontaneity and a playfulness. And you know, that's actually I think so much of the time we think of meditation, we think of mindfulness, we think of something kind of sober. Um, right, right. You know. <laughs> yes. In point of fact, in point right. of fact, when there is joy, there's laughter. Um, and and you even know this from TRE, from the sense of tremoring. Right. Now, when right. we laugh, we're right. releasing all of the, these these tensions and traumas, right? Right. And, um, and it also brings us to the present moment. Right. When we're playing, we are so in the moment and we're using the imagination and we are very alive and very present. So that is actually getting a lot to the essence of, of mindfulness. Right. Can I interrupt for a moment? Because because your your example reminded me of mine. So so my version of the um, so I'm I'm quite familiar with the the sober um the sobriety of of meditation through, through my Zen practice and and you know Zen training you know it's within a within a, a tradition and a, there's good reasons for its uh for its practices and 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 whatnot. But 
you know, I, I spent a decade or more kind of really focusing in that way. And, and, and my example of the counter, you know, without a lot of, you know, this is also some of it's connected to sort of Japanese culture was a little bit understated and things like this. But the, so to me, the counterpoint was, uh, I don't know, somewhere maybe when I was about 30 or something like that, somebody invited me to a, um, an ecstatic dance class. And I didn't even know what that was. And if I had known what it was, I probably wouldn't have gone, but Led to the hills. <laughs> I was stupid enough to go, so to speak. But anyway, so I joined, this was in Madison, Wisconsin, and I, I joined an ecstatic dance class. And I'm, sh I'm, I'm certain you know what a little bit about the ethos of ecstatic dance. It's just free. It's There's music and there's free movement, and it's not meant to be performative. It's simply an invitation to move. And some people dance excitedly. Some people rest on the floor. Some people meditate. It's sort of like anything goes. And the first class, I was like kind of trying to find, you know, my only reference points had been maybe like dancing at weddings or something like that. So this, this wasn't that. So, okay. So I came back for a second class and, and at a certain point I kind of, I caught the idea, which was nobody cares what you're doing, but, 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 uh, something inside is leading, leading you. And I just became, I, I, I was passionate about it for a few years and it was, but for me, the funniest thing was I thought my former monk self would just be a gap. It would just be jaw dropped that I'd be, you know, moving and grooving and hooting and hollering and, 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 ex and expressing joy in this way. And so anyway, um, I just, your comments just reminded me of my own, you know, having to figure that out, that there's both, both things have, have so much that, that yeah, meditation can be, can be buoyant and joyous as, as well. So just a quick thought there. Yeah. 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 Well, from um, having a, a fairly uh, rigorous spiritual practice and metaphysical training uh, that is also uh, meant to be very much applied um, to the world, um, right. I uh, studied um, theosophy for many decades. Right. I actually, as I was progressing with um, the Nia practice, started feeling a bit heretical um, in the sense that there is quite a bit of asceticism that uh, is taught. And I see. In, in theosophy, yeah. In, well, yeah. I mean, for, because theosophy draws from all the world's uh, major traditions, right. philosophies, and religions. And so many of those are taking that monk-like henna. I see. And so this was an inner conflict for me. I see. For a long time. And I couldn't figure out why Neo was so focused on um, first loving the body, um, because I thought we were supposed to transcend our attachment to the body. Yeah. Right. And then as I became more acquainted and more involved in the world and the people of the world. And I began to realize how many people of this world have suffered incredible abuse to the body True. and how devastating that is to one sense of self and ability to even connect to the body, let alone love the body. Right. Oh, and I started to recognize just what a magnificent vessel this this body is, and that is taught in in, in theosophy. Is it's it's an incredible vessel, vehicle. The thing is, yeah, don't get attached to it. Like yeah. the body is a temple. Well, what do you do at a temple? You worship the divine. You don't worship temple <laughs> at the temple. <laughs> the temple is there. It's a place in which you can worship. Right, 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 right. Right. Yeah. So, um. So my, what I came to realize, the more I did this practice of Nia, and then I was, um, once I opened Still a Living Center, I was, I was also doing Kula, and I was doing Tai Chi, and I was doing yoga, Feldenkrais. 
I began to be aware of the fact that when I am uh, observing all of these body sensations, for example, right. and remember mindfulness has to do with the power of observation. Right. The more I'm aware of myself observing these body sensations and guiding my movement appropriately, the more I'm aware of all these emotions that are going on inside of me, like I'm having this joy or this really poignant song comes on, I'm just weeping as it, moving and dancing, you know, I'm, I'm watching that emotion going on and I'm watching me, myself following this intention in the mind. Um, I started realizing, gosh, I, well, I just became a lot more intuitive. I actually was understanding different spiritual texts at a deeper level. <laughs> it was like having the opposite effect of what I'm not. Oh, I'm focusing too much on my body, but actually, you know, it opened a bunch of doors for you. Yeah, you know, it, this this power of the observer. Uh, and um, I think one of my favorite favorite quotes is, um, and I'm, I can't remember if it's Shelley or Emerson who says it, but I and the I with which the universe beholds itself and knows itself divine. I am the I by which the universe beholds itself and knows itself divine. And so that, um, actually, the power of the observer, um, I, I guess I can refer to that as um, self-awareness. Right. And so the I gave you the four pillars of the academy. Right. Uh, Attention to body sensation, continuity of consciousness, nonviolence, joy, and then the root is self awareness. Mm -hmm. um, can, can you relate that? You know, we in the beginning we teed up this the word self coaching, which caught my ears. Yeah. And I'm guessing that's related. Can you can you, how do you define that term? And it's you know it's in the title of the book, the art the art of self coaching. So. Whoa, what does that mean? Well, first, I think it starts with a stance of um, something where I, I like to call being uh, a body whisperer. If you think of a horse whisperer, uh, what are some of the qualities of a horse whisperer? The horse whisperer loves the horse, loves the horse, takes care of the horse. Right. Well, the body, uh, the horse whisperer, respects that horse right the body whisperer respects the body and the horse whisperer has a vision for what that horse is capable of that the horse itself might not know it's able to do this let's say it's a jumper yeah the horse whisperer can see how this horse could be you know leaping over these uh, these barriers and so on and the horse right. doesn't know it can do it yet Right, right. That's kind of the stance of somebody who's a body oh. whisperer, too. They see what the body could do, right. but, and the body doesn't know it yet. Right. So that's kind of a stance to start from, as, as being a body whisperer. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Yeah. And then was, what we do is um, we... We have access to this observer aspect of ourselves. We often don't access it, but it's there for us to access it. Sure, yes. And uh, so I thought maybe I would read you a, a, a little... Please do. Oh, a little man, passage from, from the yeah, book. Yeah, no, that would be wonderful, yeah. yeah. And... Um, so this is, this is an example of self-coaching. It's not only um, self-coaching the, the body, but you're going to hear also about self-coaching uh, self the emotional nature and the mind a bit too. Great. 
So we'll start out though with the body. Um, so every morning part of my um, get up, greet the day uh, morning ritual is to do um, set 10 sun salutations, yoga sun salutations in a very specific way um, at sunrise. Okay. And since I've just rolled out of bed, I often have cranky little places in the body that are complaining. I listen to those complaints and I adjust. So like my low back is pinging today. Okay, so I'm careful to tighten my buns as I do my upper back arch um, yeah, to yeah. protect that lower back. Sure. It. My left ankle's feeling weak. I put mm -hmm. more weight into my right front foot. Okay. I'll step into my warrior pose. So I'm not putting as much pressure onto that back left ankle. Yeah. Or my sh right shoulder socket's feeling vulnerable. So that's when, um, when I'm pushing back into child's pose, instead of doing this hard extension through the shoulder, I just kind of gently pull my tail backward to get into that child's pose. So I'm Got always it. doing all these little tiny mini modulations as I'm going through the different aspects of my sun salutation, according to what a, a information the body's giving me. Right, right. Um, so I'm having the, these dialogues with my body. And sure. And before I go into it, I tell my body, and this is part of the self-coaching is, I, I tell my body, I'm going to take care of you. And I always do. If the body gives me the- Reliable. You don't, you don't break your promise. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really reliable. I'm really reliable. Um, right. And uh, so it, it, my body knows it can count on me for that. So also, I have these dialogues in my self-coaching uh, with my emotions and with my mind. And so a few mornings ago, I got up and my observer self heard a pretty loud inner signal. I just don't feel like doing those sun salutations today. So my coaching self, I like to talk about there's an observer self and then there's this coaching self. Coaching self, okay, all right. So the coaching self says, who said that? <laughs> the, and, and my body's this eager little puppy and it's going, oh, I want to do it. I want to do it. Let's do our sun salutations. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but both my mental and my emotional natures objected. Okay. And so my coaching self worked out this little deal. And so my coaching self talks to the body and says, body, will you be okay if we forego just for one day our sun salutations? And I promise I will take you out for a walk this afternoon. And the body goes, yes, I can wait. Okay. Um, and I go, mind, emotions, I think it's the two of you who have been griping for the last couple of weeks now right. about these sun salutations. Right. How about if we give you a complete break for sun salutations today? Will you be willing to come back enthusiastically tomorrow? So my emotions say, uh, I was dreading doing them today. I can't feel tomorrow yet. I just really don't want to do them today. Okay. And then my mind, when I ask my mind, my mind goes, well, a ritual does not need to be a rut. I think I would be exercising more free choice if I did no sun salutations today. I think I will choose to do the sun salutations again tomorrow, though, after a rest today. I love the personalities of these these uh, these, these parts. Yeah. So, so my coaching self, right, called off the sun salutations for the morning. Right. It took my body for a walk in the afternoon. Yeah. And everybody was happy. The body, the mind, the emotions—they were all very happy. Yeah. To go back to sun salutations the next day. So. The coaching self with access 
to the observer self's view of Deception. yeah yeah of the sensations of the feelings the yeah. more emotional and of the the thoughts that that's where the the coaching self is getting them is from the observer self right yeah. he's observing yeah. all these little voices and stuff yeah yeah when the coaching self has this ability to to uh coach its way through and that would be a, just a, a funny okay. little example you of self-coaching. That's, that's a wonderful example. And it's a, what I love about that illustration is um, uh, it's, you know, it's such a common experience, right? Oh, I don't feel like doing X, Y, or Z this morning. Or, you know, every, almost everybody can relate to that. But how many of us go through that a self-reflective process to really listen, well, what's, what's going on? What's being said? What's being expressed? And so, so the way you parsed that um, is such a lovely example of the kind of listening that listening and reflecting and responding mm -hmm. that's uh, possible. So I, I love that. It's such a great illustration. Yeah. Yeah. So, so hence the the name of the book will okay. will be uh, Mindful Movement: right. The Art of Self Coaching. I love it. So when when can we look when when can we look forward to its release? Yeah, I don't, I don't quite know that yet. I've, I've got over a hundred pages printed out that I'm in the process of, kind of yep. organizing and, uh, and seeing what the presentation uh, modality is going to be for the book. Whether it's going to be in a journal, kind of format, a workbook, a read, just a, a read it. Yeah. A book. Oh, it, it's it's still in formative stages, so it's a bit early for me maybe to talk about it. Um, I'm just I don't know. I think it's a good idea to share, though. And Aaron, now, I'm glad I'm glad you did. It certainly feels you know alive for you right now, so that's very cool. Yeah. Um, I want to respect our time boundary, so so we should probably bring this rich conversation to a close. But I, and we'll put all kinds of information in the in the show notes, and people will easily be able to find um, uh, uh, the the center and how to contact you for more information. But I was going to ask for the um, for the Academy of Mindful Movement. Um, yeah. Is there any forthcoming? If somebody was interested in that, uh, in uh, um, just is it? Are there new cohorts yes. that begin several? So maybe just let us know when some how somebody could join that. Sure. Um, well, Academy of Mindful Movement dot com. Okay. Our next uh, forty hour training uh, will be starting on July twenty ninth. Okay. All right. July twenty ninth. It's a ten week course, and uh, it's it's specifically geared for people who are movement uh, coaches or instructors. Right. Um, and. We are cultivating um, different uh, workshops and so on, and and the book itself is geared more for any mover. They don't have to, you know, be a, a coach or teacher of movement. I this see. particular thing that uh, is coming up next is a um, is a forty hour training for it, people who are movement teachers or teachers or coaches or, or coaches and yes. Um, and it does include body workers. We've had uh, several body workers take, um, nice take it um, and graduate from it. Um, and we will also be putting on our website very soon um, one or two lead up like two hour workshops, so you can have a sample. Mm. A, a long one. Uh, we're taking it to. Um, the idea conference, um, mm -hmm. the idea fitness conference in July. So I am expecting it to fill up really quickly. <laughs> so maybe your uh, your listeners will actually get a jump on it before everybody else. Good. Well, act fast. That's what it sounds like to me. Yeah. Um, very good. Well, Renee, this has been a real pleasure um, hearing hearing all these different threads of of your work. And so thanks so much for sharing. My pleasure entirely. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to have you um, interested. It's wonderful to have you involved with um, Stella Living Center and uh, the wonderful healing practice that you offer and how um, your intentionality is to heal um, 
especially people who were the victims of the Maui fires this right. last August. So we're very yeah, grateful was, to you as well. I was grateful for that opportunity very much. So, yeah. all right, great. Thanks, Renee. Mahalo. <laughs> Mahalo. Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Redbeard Embodiment Podcast. To learn more, visit us at redbeardsomatictherapy.com or send me an email at alex at redbeardsomatictherapy.com. If today's conversation resonated with you, help spread the word by subscribing and sharing with others. Hope to see you next time.